Well, good morning. How are you today? Everyone good? We're all going through the sicknesses and all that stuff, but it's a brand new year, a new, York, new year to serve the Lord. We need your help, though. Stand up. Let's worship the Lord together.
for worshiping with us. Have a seat. Praise team. Hmm. What a way to start our service. Amen? Here's the second way to start our service. I need two people to help out in the nursery. We got triple digits. We got 101 kids back here that need their poopy diaper change. No, I'm just kidding. We got double digits, which means there's uh, more than 10, so we need some people back there to help. No, ma'am. You do nothing in this church. You do the Iwana program. You sing on our praise team. You go back there. You help out whenever anybody asks. Somebody else, please. We're wearing out our good workers. Yes. No, I got the hand back there. All right. There you go. Got those two. You guys always volunteer, man. Somebody else. We need some new meat in there. Some fresh meat. That, that was not an age thing. I, I'm sorry. I didn't mean that to be an age thing. All right, let's redirect. We've got to get into our scripture reading today. Open your Bibles to Philippians chapter 1. Thank you so much. I appreciate your volunteering. All right, we've got to get back into joy. And so we want to put Christ back in everything this year. That is 2023 theme. And so today we're going to put Christ back in our joy. Let Christ be your joy. Amen? Amen. So Paul writes the book of Philippians, and it's on joy. It's all about joy. And I think it's time we put joy back into life because joy is actually found in Christ. Right? Okay. One of you are in agreement. Awesome. So here's the idea. Jesus is our joy. In John 15, 11, he says this. These things have I spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. So Jesus came to give us joy and the fullness of joy. Paul said that this is how we live in the kingdom here and now. It's part of the kingdom, Romans 14, 17. He says, for the kingdom of God is not just a matter of eating and drinking, but it's righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. And this is what the Apostle John began to write in his uh, epistle, 1 John. (coughs) Excuse me. He said that we we saw Jesus, we, we lived with Jesus, we walked around with Jesus. He said, our hands have handled concerning the words of eternal life. And he said, we're giving you this eternal life. We're giving you all this information. And in 1 John 1, 4, he says, and I'm writing these things down so that our joy may be complete. We need complete joy. And so if you have salvation, then you have Jesus, you're in Christ. Your joy should be complete because you don't need anything else. Amen? All right. Now pay attention to this because this is important. In Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 through 7, Paul says this. He says, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication... With thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Everything is in Christ Jesus. Now, I want you to look at that word there, thanksgiving. He says, don't be anxious, but by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. Now, this is an interesting word. We see this in in the English But I don't think you understand how important it is to go back to the Greek. So this word thanksgiving, it comes from the Greek word eucharistia. And this is where we get our English word eucharist from. Simply means to give thanks. I think uh, uh, the Roman Catholics use that for uh, communion. They they call it the Eucharist. Uh, We call it Lord's Supper, communion, whatever. It means to give thanks. And that's what we're doing. We're giving thanks for what Christ has done. Now... That word is a compound word. It comes from two words, and they put it into one. The first word is UK. UK means to wish, to um, ask, or to pray uh, in consideration with God. You're praying to God. You're asking God. Uh, you're vowing to God. And the second word is caro, C-H-A-I-R-O, caro. And that word means to have gladness or to rejoice. And in John 15, when Jesus says, I have, I have uh, spoken these words that you may have joy, that my joy may be in you and your joy may be full. That word joy is the jo- word caro. 
And then where Paul says in Romans 14, 17, the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy. Carol. And then John says in 1 John 1, 4, I wrote these things so that our joy, Carol, may be full. That's the word Carol. So it's in thanksgiving. And so you're like, well, well how does that work together? Well, the full word would mean this. In, in, to express joyous gratitude for the benefits or the blessings you've received. That's to give gladness. That's thanksgiving. To give joyous or be glad as an expression or an attitude for what you've been given. And so here's the idea. We're, we're thanking God and rejoicing just for salvation. And when we pray, we pray in an attitude of joy, rejoicing, gladness. That's the idea of asking with thankfulness. That's prayer, speaking to God in an attitude of joy. Well, that's true biblical joy anyway. That's how we should be, to be thankful for what has been given, namely salvation. Everything in our spiritual life and the new life and the kingdom life comes from our salvation. And that should give us joy. And that's uh, in Philippians 4.1. Paul says this, he says, Therefore, my brothers whom I love and long for, my joy and my crown, stand firm thus in the Lord my beloved. Do you understand how important it is to witness to people to see that they come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ? Because in all eternity, those people that you see saved are going to be your joy. Your joy here and your joy there. We are talking about it on Wednesday night when um, Daniel chapter 12 verse 3 and, and Matthew 13, Jesus was talking about people who witness to other people and they get saved. You are going to be a shining star in eternity. The more people you get saved, the brighter you'll shine. Amen? Are you going to be a star? Are you going to burn out? I want to be seen. I want to be bright. I'm not going to be as bright as the bright morning star because that's the brightest. But I will be a reflection of him through the people that I see come to the saving knowledge of Jesus. But that is our joy. That is our crown of rejoicing here and now to see people come to Christ. And it's going to be our joy in all eternity. I hope you understand that. In 1 Thessalonians 2.19, Paul says the same thing again. For what is our hope? What is our joy, our crown of boasting before the Lord Jesus when he comes? Is it not you? Stop and think about this. How many people you've led to the Lord? Then the moment Jesus comes back, transforms us in the uh, rapture, and we go to heaven, guess what? You have no more opportunity to witness to somebody to see that they come to the kingdom. And if you have, and you've come to the kingdom, you're going you're to be bright. You're going to be shining bright, man, and you're going to have awesome joy, eternal joy, because you led somebody to the Lord. Took them from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light, from the kingdom of Satan to the kingdom of God. And that's what we're trying to do. And that's the message of salvation in a nutshell. Matter of fact, that's a Christmas story. Do you remember? Have we forgotten Christmas already? I think we have. Some have. You got all your trees put down? Anybody still got their tree up? Oh, wow. I was going to make fun of the one, but I, there's too many now. All right. Hey, to each their own. There's uh, nothing wrong with it. You don't keep them all year long, do you? No? You're okay. Good. <laughs> I wouldn't have made fun of that. But listen, in Luke 2.10, this is what the angels told them. They said, fear not, before behold, I bring you good news of what? Great joy. Great joy. That's going to be for who? All people. There it is. What's the joyous news that's going to be for all people? We got to go on to verse 11 in Luke 2. He says, For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. That's the joy that God sent, a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. Isn't that awesome? That's the gospel message. That's joy come down to us. We have been saved from our sins, from the penalty of sins. And when you accept Christ, you are a slave to sin. We just sang about it. When you accept Jesus, you now become a child of God. Your sins are forgiven. The penalty is paid. And now you have heaven and eternal life. And that's the hope that we have in this life. That we're part of a kingdom and we're waiting for that kingdom to come. And so that's the hope. I don't know about you, but I want to hear those wonderful words in Matthew 25, 23, where Jesus says, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. But don't stop there. He says, Enter into the what? Joy of your Lord. Of your master. That's it, man. That's salvation. And when it comes to fruition, it'll be eternal life. 
Well done, good and faithful servant. Come on in, enjoy your Lord. I will. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. I hope to shine bright. That's what it should be, I should say. To have salvation, to experience gladness, which is true joy. And this is where the Apostle Paul lived. He was stoned, he was beaten, he was shipwrecked, he was bitten by a serpent where he should have died. All kinds of things happened to that man. And through all of life's circumstances, he had joy. And this is what he says, chapter 1. People are going to disappoint you, but I still got joy. Chapter 2, he said, look, uh, circumstances are going to, your plans are going to disappoint you. Uh, Epaphroditus, I'm sending back. Timothy, I'm sending back. I'm going to be by myself. I'm in prison, but I still got joy. He says in chapter 3, I've lost all my possessions. Everything is just dumb, but I've still got joy. In chapter 4, he goes, the situation I'm in now, all by myself, I'm about, I might die in this one, I don't know, I'm in prison, but I still got joy. And that's the message, man. If you're go- This is what we're going to learn over the next year, year and a half, however long it takes if the Lord tarries, we're going to go through it. Stopping here and there for special stuff. People are going to fail you. Plans are going to fail you. Your possessions are going to fail you. And circumstances will fail you. But it should never, 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 ever touch your joy. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Matt, you want to open us in a word of prayer, please? If you're there in Philippians chapter 1, let's look at verse 1. A brief recap. We started off with this. I'm not going to dive into it as much as I did, but he says, Paul and Timothy, bondservants of Jesus Christ. We talked about that word bondservant. It translates as slave, but it's not a slave in the idea that we think of today. The idea in the biblical sense is you are binding yourself to a new master out of love. You love Jesus, you're going to bind yourself to him, thank you for salvation, I want it, here I am. I don't want to serve sin, I want to serve you. And that's basically what it is. You're called a bond servant because you're willfully binding yourself to a new master out of love. And that's salvation, you're denying sin, self, and you're putting your trust in what Jesus did. He becomes your new master. And then, let's finish out that verse there, he says, To all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi with the bishops and deacons. Now notice that the bishops and deacons are actually included in the word saints. He's talking to everybody that's there. So what is a saint? Here's the word. The word saint comes from the Greek hagios. Hagios simply means holy. It means set apart. It means righteous. And that's exactly what we are. If you're in Christ, you are declared holy. You are declared righteous. You are set apart. And so you know the term Holy Spirit, right? You know what that word holy is? Hagios. It's funny how the Holy Spirit, Hagios pneuma, that's the Greek, because spirit is uh, air in motion, pneuma. That's where we get pneumatic tools, right? All you mechanics, air tools, pneumatology, pneumonia, deals with the lungs, air in motion. The Holy Spirit, Hagios Numa. We are declared holy, Hagios, but it translates saint. Same word. So you have holy, you have saint, you have set apart. Now, in, in 1 Corinthians 6, 11, Paul says it this way. He said, he's talking about all the nasty stuff that the people out in the world do. And he said, well, some of you used to do that stuff. You were like that, but now you're washed. You are sanctified. You're justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. That word sanctified there comes from the Greek word hagiazo, which is a form of the word hagios. And all it means is to be made holy, to be set apart, to be made holy. It's the verb form of the word hagios. And the whole idea is this. You're to be set apart unto God for his purposes. So you were... You were You're taking something that was dedicated to to this, and now you're being dedicated to the Lord. So for us, it was like you were a slave to sin, 
and you were dedicated to destruction, but now you're going to bind yourself out of love to the Lord Jesus. Now you're dedicated to his purposes. And there's a difference. There's a huge difference. So we who are saints is anybody who's in Christ, right? We'll go back here to uh, Philippians chapter 1, verse 1. He says, to all the saints in Christ. If you have salvation, then you're in Christ. Amen? Amen. If you're in Christ, you're declared righteous, you're declared holy, you're set apart, and you're a saint. Period. End of discussion. So anybody who is in Jesus. Now, I've never met a Buddhist to say, hey, are you a Buddhist? Yeah, I'm in Buddha. What? What does that mean? Hey, uh, I'm a Muslim. Oh, I'm in, I'm in Muhammad. What does that mean? Never met a Mormon that said, oh, yeah, I'm in Joseph Smith. No, because it's something that's only reserved for a Christian. Because if you're a Christ follower, if you're a born-again believer, you are fused with the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you understand that? You're in Christ. You're, you're fused with him. In Romans 6, 4, Paul says this. We were buried Therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. 2 Corinthians 5, 7, if anybody is in Christ, you're a brand new creation. Old things have passed away, behold, all things become new, right? I mean, I don't think we understand how much all this stuff um, jukes and jives with each other. Genesis to Revelation is one love story from God to man, and it all makes sense. You got to get to know it, and that's how you get to know him. Because that's a picture of baptism. Baptism doesn't save you. But you know what it does? It's an outward profession of your inward decision. It's an act of obedience to Jesus' commands. And it shows everything that took place by the Holy Spirit baptizing you into the body of Christ. Amen? There's a verse right there. You, were, you, were, you died with him. You're buried like baptism. Baptism is full immersion. So now you are buried with Jesus, fully immersed into Jesus. Isn't that beautiful? You're in Christ. Galatians 2.20, Paul says this. I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave, me himself, uh, gave himself for me. Look, I live. No, not I live. No, I died. No, I died with Christ. No, now I live. No, I'm a new creature, and it's Jesus living through me. It's not me no more. It's him. We're fused together. Paul says in Galatians 3.3, I love this. He said, you have died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. You're fused. You're in Christ. You're fused with Jesus. And that's why Paul said, I'm a bondservant, because I willfully bound myself to Jesus out of love. Amen? Amen. That's salvation. Saints include anybody who's in Christ. Deacons, bishops, pastors, lay people, whoever. You're in Christ, you're a saint. You remember Acts 16, the start, the inception of the uh, Philippian church? So there were two people. Lydia, she was a seller of purper. purper, purper. <laughs> That's a statement. That's my statement. <laughs> I won't get into that one. Purple. I, yeah, I got problems up here, so... <laughs> I, I can use the word retard because I'm using it in the sense of a truck driver because that's what a Jake brake is. It's an engine retarder that, that distorts the engine, so there's a lot of distortion going on up there. And then you can't fire back because you're just blank. There it is. Act 60. Oh, gosh. Okay. It's like, I got a lot on my mind, man. Come on. Give me a break. So Act 16. All right, let's redirect. Acts 16. So we're talking about the uh, Philippian church. So there's only two people that began the church in the beginning. You have Lydia, who was a seller of purple, and then, of course, the Philippian jailer. And then, of course, when the Philippian jailer got uh, saved, he got baptized, him and his household, and it began to um, expand. And so now Paul's in prison in Rome, and he's writing back this letter, and he's like, look, man, to all the saints. There's tons of people. There's tons of fruit that he produced, because now you're seeing a lot of people who are saved. Now you're seeing a lot of saints. He's saying to all you people back at the church at Philippi, 
the saints, the bishops, the deacons, um, which means that there were a collective of different pastors. So there had to be more than one church, probably home churches at this point. They didn't have a true building because uh, they had to meet outside for prayer time because they didn't have like a synagogue where most of the bigger cities did. So probably a bunch of home churches. So probably got a bunch of home pastors that are going around to people making sure they're doing. So you got tons of people. There's all kinds of saints. But that's the beauty because that's going to be joy. When you start leading people to the Lord, you're going to start to have more and more joy. Amen? Amen. And so this is, this is what he does. In every one of his letters, he gives a greeting to all those people. Uh, look back in Philippians 1. Look at verse 2. He says, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And every one of Paul's letters from Romans to 1 and 2 Corinthians to Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1 and 2 Thessalonians, Timothy, Titus, Philemon, every one of them. He opens it up, somehow saying, I, Paul, an apostle, a slave of Jesus, peace and grace. I wish you peace, and I wish you grace. Peace and grace. Every one of his letters, he opens that up. And so here's the idea. Let's go through those two words. The word grace is the word keros. Does that sound familiar? C-H-A-I-R-I-S. Sounds like the word kero. So you've been saved by grace. You've been given God's grace, right? Do you know what that word means in the Greek? It's a form of the word kero, which is joy and gladness. And it's a verb form, which means to receive joy and gladness. Do you get that? That's God's grace. I've been given God's gladness. I've been given God's joy. Do you see that? Do you miss that? Am I the only one? I know I miss a lot up here, but some of that stuff sticks now. Listen, do you love your children? I'm telling you, if you were to give your child to somebody else in marriage, wouldn't you be giving a part of your joy to them? Can I tell you that's exactly what the Father did? Do you understand that? That's exactly what God the Father did. He gave his joy to us. In Isaiah 53, uh, verse 10, he talks about, <laughs> now I can't see how any father would do this, but God is totally different in his love for us. It says that it pleased God the Father to give his son to the cross for us. Can you believe that? It pleased the Father to turn his back on the son. Can you imagine that? I can't. That humanly speaking, that, that's a God thing. That's that agape love, the God love. God took pleasure in crucifying his son. Why? So that grace would fall to us. So that his son, which was wrapped up in his goodness, his gladness, and his joy, would be given to us. And that's exactly what Jesus says in Hebrew chapter 12, verse 2. For the joy that was set before Jesus. He endured the cross. What's the joy of going to the cross? So that he can have people in heaven with him. Do you remember John chapter 12? Jesus said, unless a grain of wheat dies, it abides alone. Unless he died, he would have nobody in heaven with him. And for the joy that was set before him, so that Jesus could have brothers and sisters and co-rulers in the kingdom, he went to the cross with joy. He endured the cross. For the joy that was set forth, that he could have believers in heaven. Man, I, grace is God's gladness, his joy by giving over his son to be crucified so I can have salvation. That's grace. Grace is something that's given that's not deserved. I don't deserve anything that his son has to offer me. But he gave it to me as a gift. And that's why... You can't earn salvation. It's not given as something earned. That's why Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, for by grace you have been saved. By God's joy you were saved. By God's gladness he saved you as a gift. It's not your own doing. It's a gift of God, not as a result of works, so that nobody can boast. It's his free gift of joy. Man, how awesome is that? It's undeserved. It's unearned. God gave us what we don't deserve. Grace. And as a result of his grace, now we have peace. We have peace with God. 
In Romans chapter 5, verse 1, Paul says, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's because if, if you're in Christ, if you're fused with Christ, do you remember uh, Isaiah, the Christmas thing? Isaiah 9, 6 and 7. Behold, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Prince of Peace. If you are infused with Jesus, then you're infused with peace. Now you have peace with God. And now you can have the peace of God. The wicked of this world will never know true peace. Isaiah says in Isaiah 48, 22, there is no peace, says the Lord, for the wicked. The wicked will have no peace. But the peace that Jesus gives us is so much different than the world gives to us. In John 14, 27, Jesus said, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives. Do I give to you? Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. I got the peace of Jesus. And that's exactly what Paul had. What are you going to do? Kill me? You can't threaten me with heaven. Bring it on. And that's exactly what happened. But he did more knowing he was a dead man walking than he did trying to save his life. Amen? Amen. Think about that one. The world gives a false sense of peace. And Jeremiah says that. In chapter 6, verse 14, he says that the, the world, they, they've healed the wounded of the people lightly, superficially. Not really, but it just kind of looks like it. They're like, oh, peace, peace. But actually, there is no peace. There's none. Matter of fact, Jesus died to give us peace. There's that. Why did he endure the cross for the joy of it? So he could give us peace. Isaiah 53, verse 5 says this. But he was pierced for our transgression. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us what? Peace. And with his wounds we're healed. Mm. That's awesome. The angel proclaimed that in the Christmas story in Luke 2. Moving on to verse 14. He said, I give you good news. It'll be to all people. Great joy. A savior. And then they began to sing glory to God in the highest. And on earth, peace. Among those whom he is pleased. Oh, that's amazing. Peace. Peace. Once you have God's peace and you begin to show that, that shows you, it gives you evidence. People need evidence, and there you go. This is evidence that you have the Holy Spirit and that he is at work in your life. Galatians 5, 22. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, caro, and peace. Peace. That's why Jesus said that we're called to be peacemakers. Matthew 5, verse 9. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Are you a peacemaker or are you a troublemaker? <laughs> That's an easy one. We're called to be peacemakers. Make peace. Jesus wants us to seek peace. Matter of fact, in Psalm 34, 14, he says, Turn away from evil, do good, and seek peace and pursue it. Paul says in Romans 14, 19 this, so let us pursue what makes for peace and for mutual building up. He says in Romans 12, 18, he says, if at all possible, so far as it depends on you, not somebody else, but as long as it depends on you, you live peaceably with everybody. And the only way to do that is to allow Christ, allow his peace to rule your heart. Christ needs to come back into our peace. So that he can rule. Colossians 3.15, Paul says this. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. To which indeed you are called in one body. And be thankful. Remember that thankfulness? There's that joy. Let Christ's peace rule with thankfulness and joy. Isn't that amazing? I would say let Christ's peace rule your heart with an attitude of rejoicing. That's a better way to say that. So... It all boils down to this. It's a choice. It is a choice that we make to either trust God and his promises, letting his peace rule in our hearts, or you're going to rely on yourselves and you're going to reject the peace that God offers. Not only in salvation, but in all aspects of life after salvation. That's where you're letting Christ's peace rule your life. I think we've, we've gotten so far away from what should be and what shouldn't be. It's not a bunch of do's and don'ts, but man, 
I think we're not living in the kingdom. We're living in the world, and we want everything that it has because it's abundant. It's abundant in this life. But you have to understand, God is the source for everything for you if you're a Christian. He's the source of everything that we have as Christians. Don't ever forget that. In Philippians verse one, uh, chapter 1, verse 2, he says, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. It all comes from him. In Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 10, it says this, Do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Isn't that awesome? The joy of the Lord gives us strength. And when you have that peace with God, you can have peace of God. You can have that perfect fellowship with God. And man, when you're walking with the Lord, guess what? As the psalmist says in Psalm 16, 11, in your presence there is fullness of joy. When you walk close with the Lord, that's what the apostle Paul did. He walked close with the Lord. And as he walked in the presence of God, he had fullness of joy in anything he did. Do you know why? Because that man could go out be stoned to death outside of a city and have so much peace and joy in the Lord Jesus, he got right back up and went back into the city that stoned him. Man, that's got to be a heart that's controlled by Christ's peace. Look, I said before, you know, we're, that's, the, that's the message Paul gave. That's the message that he had. Most assuredly, people are going to fail you. But you can still have joy. Your circumstances are going to fail you at some point. But you can still have joy. Your possessions will fail you. But you can still have joy. And all the plans in the world that you can make are going to fail you. But you can still have joy. Nothing that this life gives you should ever, ever take away your true joy. And that's the question you should ask yourself. Do you have grace? Do you have peace? Then you should have joy. And if not, then you might want to examine yourself. Let's pray. Father, thank you for our time this morning. Thank you for your word. It uh, should be our joy to know that our sins are forgiven. Thank you for your son, for the joy. You gave us your son who is your joy so that we could have salvation, heaven, and eternal life for joy that gives us peace with you. And we should have peace, not as the world gives, but you give us peace, tranquility to go through this life knowing that we are part of the kingdom. We're going to have a new body. We're going to be in your kingdom for all eternity and we'll be with you forever. That, that alone should give us joy. Joy to live through this life, no matter what happens to us, we have your peace and your grace. Father, I pray if there's someone here this morning, maybe, maybe they've never come to your saving grace. Maybe, maybe they don't understand what it, what it means to have salvation. They don't know what that word means. But I want to show them what the Bible says, Lord. I, I want them to know and come to the saving knowledge of your son. Maybe they, they come to church all the time. Maybe they sit down. Maybe they read the Bible. Maybe they believe that your son Jesus is God and he died on the cross. But you have to be that bondservant. You have to make that commitment. Just because you do those things doesn't make salvation automatic. And so, God, I pray if somebody has never made that commitment to your son Jesus, let today be the day of salvation. I'd love to explain it to him. Father, for your church, man, what joy we're going to have for those that have witnessed to people, for those that have gotten people saved so that they can be a light, a shining uh, star, as you say, in all eternity. They're going to be our joy for all eternity. Man, if you want joy, what an awesome thing it is to go out and witness to people, to see them come to the saving knowledge of your son, to help disciple them, to grow them. Man, there's no greater joy than to do that. That's what your son did with 12 disciples, and they went out and made disciples and disciples, and we're called to go make disciples ourselves. Oh, Lord, we would, see, we, we would see revival if we would just let it happen individually. We love you, God, and we just commit this uh, time to you, this uh, time of invitation. We just pray that you'd have your way, God, and we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.